Hello friends. So today we're gonna to be reading chapter three of Box of Shocks. In chapter two, Oliver found his first shock to put in his box when he went trick-or-treating. So let's see what happens in the third chapter. <clears throat> On Tuesdays after school, Mum leaves her job at the bank early to drive me to a piano lesson with Mrs. Barker, the nastiest piano teacher in the known universe. She's about as friendly as a runaway lawnmower. Unfortunately, Dad and Mom think that Mrs. Barker is the best piano p teacher in the city. I tell them I'd rather spend Tuesday's afternoon swimming in a pool of hungry dung beetles than take piano lessons with Mrs. Barker. I tell them her breath could kill a rhino at a hundred paces and that she must use mouthwash from the Black Lagoon. I tell them that I'm sure her place has fleas because I'm always itchy by the end of each lesson. I could give a million reasons why I don't like going to Miss Barker, but it's no use. Whenever I complain about my piano lessons, Mum says, taking piano lessons from Miss Barker is a wonderful opportunity. Your father and I think that learning a musical instrument is a valuable experience for you. There's no point in arguing. My parents aren't any good at changing their minds. One morning at breakfast, about three weeks after Halloween, Mum says, I'm sorry, Oliver, the assistant manager at work is sick, uh, so I can't get away this afternoon to drive you to piano. Dad can't take you because he's teaching at college. Grandpa Golly's away at a pet show and won't be back until tomorrow. I phoned the Cromwells to see if they could drive you, but they're in Vancouver this week. And Miss Findelson has sprained her ankle, so she can't drive. We'll have to cancel your lesson, she says. That's when I see an opportunity, a golden opportunity. No, you can't cancel my lesson, I say. Oh, Mum raises her eyebrows. You mean you actually want to go to piano lessons? Of course I do. What about Miss Barker's bad breath, Dad says, and the fleas? I have to come up with a good reason for changing my mind about Mrs. Barker. Otherwise, Mum and Dad might get suspicious. Uh, well, like you always tell me, Dad, there are some sacrifices we have to make in life. In the end, it'll all be worth it, right? It's my dad turned to raise his eyebrow. I'm not sure he totally believes me. I don't mind walking to my lesson, I say. I'll just have to leave right after school. You don't mind walking all the way to Miss Barker's? Mom says, it's a long way. I could use the exercise, I tell her, and it's not that far. Mom and dad look at each other and shrug. If you're keen to do it, Ollie, I guess that's fine, Dad says. Mom looks a little worried. I'll give you my cell phone just in case and be sure to watch out for mean dogs. Mom's always telling me to watch out for mean dogs. I have a scar from when I was three and a toy poodle bit me at the park. I don't really remember that happening, but Mom has never forgotten. Yeah, Mom, I'll watch out for mean dogs, I say. Mom gives me more instructions. I keep nodding and saying, yep, sure thing. You betcha, I'll remember. But while Mom talks, I'm thinking of something else. Something I'm adding to my spectacular box of shocks. I leave school at three and head to Mrs. Barker's house. About a minute after I walk through her door, the phone rings. It's Mom calling to make sure I made it okay. Yes, I made it okay, Mom, I say. I wasn't abducted by aliens and I didn't fall through a crack in the sidewalk. I made it here just fine. And no, I didn't see any mean dogs along the way. My piano lesson doesn't go well, mainly because I can't stop thinking about what I'm planning on doing right after. Every time I imagine my next shock, I'll add to my box of shocks, I have to smile. I even smile as I smell Mrs. Barker's swamp breath and hear her screech, it's obvious that you haven't been practicing. You're wasting your parents' money. I don't care what she says. All I do is smile and think of my plan for my walk home. At 4.30, I leave Mrs. Barker's house, but I'm not heading home. I'm heading for the back alley behind Vernon Street. I've got some extra time because mom won't be leaving work until at least 5.30 and the class dad teaches doesn't end until six. This should give me all the time I need. 
The alley behind Vernon Street is famous for one very big, very loud, very dangerous reason. Along the side of an alley is a tall, rickety wooden fence. Behind that fence lives a dog, a dog known as Spike McChomp. Everyone knows Spike is nastier than nasty. Someone at school told me he's a bulldog, rottweiler, wolf cross with a bit of rhino and velociraptor thrown in there. When Spike stands on his hind legs, you could see his great slobbering mouth full of blood-stained teeth. At least that's what I've heard. I've never actually seen the dog or stood beside the tall rickety fence or even been down the back alley until now. I like most dogs uh, and Chomp, like most dogs, loves chewing things, but instead of chewing on bones, he chews on scraps of metal like old washing machines and wrecked cars. He got his name from his favorite snack, six inch long iron spikes. They say the backyard where Spike McChomp lives is littered with chewed up bits of iron spikes. There's another thing they say about Spike McChomp. He is pretty much blind, so he sniffs around the backyard and tracks things down with his nose. Sure, trick-or-treating at the Milburn house might have been a little scary, but at the Milburn house, there wasn't much of a chance of getting chewed to tiny bits by a vicious beast that has three different kinds of rabies and teeth that look like they were borrowed from a shark. That's why sneaking into Spike McChomp's yard to steal one of his chewed up spikes is way, way, way more dangerous than anything I've ever done in my life. Mom and dad would freak out if they knew I was even standing here in the back alley instead of walking straight home. But getting one of Spike's spikes for my box of shocks is something I have to do. First, I climb the fence. I jump up and grab the top, pull myself up and hook my knee over. As I balance on the top of the fence, I look down into the yard. There he is, over by the house. The one and only Spike McChomp. Every story I've heard about this dog is true. He's as big as I imagined, maybe even bigger. And he looks just as nasty with mangy tufts of scruffy black fur and bald patches crisscrossing his scarred body. One of his ears is missing, and his tail looks like it's been bitten or chopped off. He's laying on his stomach, his legs sprawled out from his barrel-shaped body. His eyes are closed, his mouth is hanging open, and little drool dribbles are falling between his teeth that look like bla saw blades. On one side of the yard is a banged up old washing machine and a twisted fender full of teeth marks but I'm more interested in what's scattered around the dirt. Dozens of chewed up iron spikes. One of those bits of spikes would be perfect in my box of shocks. The only problem is getting one out of the yard without being eaten alive by Spike McChomp. I'm hoping that the stories about him being blind are true. Otherwise, I'm taking one of his, otherwise, taking one of his spikes would be impossible. Here goes nothing. I whisper as I swing my legs off the fence, hanging by my hands from the top. I count to three and let go. I drop to the ground. I know there's no turning back. I'm now officially in the backyard of the legendary Spike McChomp. Right away, I look over at him. One of his legs is twitching, but he looks as if he's asleep. Sure, he might be blind, but no one ever said he was deaf. I figured the only way to cross the yard without being noticed is to move like a ninja. Not that I've ever moved like a ninja before, but if I'm gonna learn, this would be a good time. Looking around the dirt yard, I spot the closest piece of chewed up spike. It's only about 10 feet away. I begin to creep towards it. And with each step, I glance over at the snoozing Spike McChomp. I hope he's having a really good dream about chewing up a Porsche and won't want to wake up. Step by step by step, I cross the yard until I finally reach the piece of chewed up spike. Crouching down, I carefully pick it up. It's covered in slobber. And as I turn to creep back to the fence, the spike slips from my fingers. <gasps> 
the small chunk of iron hits the ground with a tiny thud. But a tiny thud is loud enough to wake Spike McChomp. He shoots straight up onto his feet and turns his ugly face right at me. I guess he's not blind after all. It's time to get out of Spike's yard before he turns me into dog food. But I'm not leaving without my piece of Spike. In one quick motion, I scoop it off the ground, whirl around, and sprint towards the fence. Behind me, I hear a roaring sound, like nothing I've ever heard before. Maybe this thing really is part Velocal Raptor. I can hear his giant paws thumping across the dirt, getting closer by the second. Maybe he's also part cheetah. I reach the fence and jump, grabbing for the top. If I slip and fall back down, I'll be Spike McChomp snack food. Way more tender than a washing machine. I reach for the top of the fence with both hands, but my left one can't hold on because it's clutching this piece of Spike. Luckily, my right hand holds tight. I try to pull myself up with one arm, but suddenly I feel a tug on my shoe. Spike McChomp is ripping the shoe right off my foot. Luckily, my foot is still attached to my leg. Good thing I never tie up my shoelaces. I hope the ugly mutt will be happy gnawing on my shoe while I make my getaway. But all of a sudden, I feel a tug at my other shoe and he rips that one off too. I have to admit, I'm a little worried at this point. I almost let go of the spike so I could use both arms to pull myself up over the fence and then I think, forget it. I don't care how vicious this mutant beast is. I'll hold on to my piece of spike and take my chances. I try to use my feet to climb the fence, but as I swing my leg up, Spike McChomp grabs me by the pant leg. I kick and tug and tug and kick some more, but Spike McChomp must be part crocodile. Be a nice doggy and let go, I shout. Don't ask me why I say that. Obviously, Spike is not a nice doggy. He is downright ferocious. There's no chance he'll let go of my pant leg just because I asked nicely. I can feel my fingers losing their grip on the top of the fence, so I have to do something, and I have to do it now. I can only think of one thing to do. It's not an idea I really like, but there doesn't seem to be any choice. With the hand that is holding the spike, I reach down and undo my belt buckle and unzip my pants, careful not to drop the spike. It takes less than a second for Spike McChomp to pull my pants right off. He's chewing them to shreds while I hang from the fence in my underwear. I manage to scramble over the wonky fence before he has a chance to grab my bare legs. I glance down and see him swallowing my belt like it's a giant spaghetti noodle. Now that I'm out of the dog's reach, all I have to do is jump down into the alley and somehow get home without anyone seeing me. That won't be so easy at five in the afternoon on a Tuesday. I'm about to jump down when I hear a crack and a bang. The whole fence is moving. It's falling over with me on it. The fence hits the ground in a great cloud of dust and I'm sent tumbling across the alley. When I finally stop rolling, I jump to my feet. I'm standing in the middle of the alley in my underwear with Spike McChomp staring right at me across the splintered fence. He lifts his snout and takes a couple of strong sniffs. He launches himself right at me. I figure I'm dead meat. There's no chance I could run around him. There's nothing I could do except close my eyes and wait. In less than two seconds, I will feel Spike McChomp's razor sharp teeth sink into my leg. It will be gory. It will be painful. It will probably be the tastiest meal Spike McChomp has eaten since his last set of studded snow tires. But I don't feel the sharp teeth from Spike McChomp. All I feel is the brush of his mangy fur as he streaks past me. When I open my eyes, there is Spike McChomp charging down the alley. Right ahead of him is a black cat. I always thought black cats were supposed to be bad luck, but no, not today. With Spike McChomp out of the way, I can head for home. There's only one small problem. I'm in my underwear. My pants are being digested in Spike McChomp's iron gut. 
I'm trying to figure out what to do next when I spot a laundry line in one of the nearby backyards. Hanging from that line is a bunch of clothes. I'm sure no one will mind if I borrow something to wear. After all, it's an emergency. I'm sure they'll understand. I'll return the clothes later, washed and ironed. I sneak through the back gate, checking for vicious dogs and spying neighbors. I yank the first thing I could find off the clothesline and scramble back to the safety behind the fence. I hold up the piece of clothing, hoping it'll fit, which it definitely won't since I grabbed an old lady's flower dress. There's got to be something better on the laundry line. When I look over the fence, I could see someone peering out the window. Sneaking back into the yard would not be a good idea. It's either wear the flower dress or walk home in my underwear. The dress is downright baggy and I have to hold it up with my right hand, otherwise it'll fall to the ground. For obvious reasons, I avoid walking along the main streets. Instead, I try to cut through back alleys, across backyards, and through a few vacant lots. I finally reach our back fence, slip through the gate, and run to the back door. Luckily, mom and dad aren't home yet. I race up the stairs and into my room. I made it! And I'm pretty sure no one saw me. Now that I'm in the safety of my room, I open my hand and take a close look at the piece of chewed up spike. I have to say, it's pretty amazing. Teeth marks all up and down the spike with one of the ends chewed right off. Before my parents get home, I've got to hide the spike in my box of shocks. I head to my closet and take the box from its hiding place. When I open the lid, there's a piece of Halloween candy from the Milburn house. I remember the thrill of that Halloween night as if it was yesterday. And now, I've got something else. Not only have I survived trick-or-treating at some quasi-zombie monster thingy's house, I've escaped the deadly teeth of the most vicious bulldog, rottweiler, wolf, rhino, velociraptor beast in the entire city, probably the entire world. I place the spike beside the candy and think, only two things in my box of shocks and already my collection is amazing. As I'm sliding the box back into its hiding place, I hear the front door open. Oliver, I'm home, mom calls. How was your piano lesson? I head out of my bedroom and I'm about to start down the stairs when I realize I'm still wearing the flower dress. Whirling around, I sprint back into my room before she sees me. I'm pretty good at lying, but trying to explain why I'm wearing an old lady's dress might be impossible, even for me. And that is the end of chapter three. <laughs> what a scary shock. There's no way I would ever go into a Rottweiler's backyard, but hey, I'm not as brave as Oliver. Okay, I hope you guys like that chapter. I'll be back in a few days with chapter four. All right, I will see you guys later. Bye.